Um, so hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, today, we're very happy to have uh, Dr. Lucien Wang with us to talk about her research on BE stars. Um, so Lucien uh, did her uh, graduate work and a postdoctoral position at the Center for High Angular Resolution Astronomy um, in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Georgia State University. Um, and currently, she's working um, at the Yunnan Astronomical Observatories in the Chinese or at the Chinese Academy of Science, um, which is in Kunming in the uh, Yunnan province of China. Um, and it's very, very late in the evening for Lucian um, in China. So we thank her for making the time for us today um, to be here to give this talk. So I think everyone's very excited to hear what she has to say. So without further ado, Lucian, uh, take it away. Thank you. Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depends on where you are. Yeah, so many thanks to Carol for inviting me and, give, um, and giving this opportunity to us to share our research results to the community. And thanks to Mark for the uh, introduction. Uh, so today I'm going to share about our uh, very interesting results from our recent works on searching for the hot subdwarf companions of the B stars. So first for my talk today, uh, can you see anything? Okay, yeah, first, I want to thank my advisor, Dr. Douglas Geis from the Chara Array, Georgia State University for the help, and also my collaborators, including Dr. Geronim Peters from University of Southern California, and Dr. Eva Goldenberg from Carnegie Observatories, and also Dr. George Novosky from the Apache Point Observatory in the New Mexico State University, and also Dr. Catherine Nestor, and also Dr. Stephen Hobbio from NASA Ames Research, uh, Research Center. So without all their help, yeah, this work can be done. And also this, uh, the content of the talk today, so the, uh, is, is uh, funded by the NASA programs under the GEO proposal 15659. So for my talk today, so there are five different portions. Uh, in the beginning, I will briefly talk about the physical properties and also the spectrum properties for the BE stars, and then briefly, um, briefly uh, discuss the evolutionary scenarios for the BE star and their formation history. And then later on, I will talk about the historical detections for the B and STO binary resistance from literature. And then following that, I will talk about our past work on searching for the STO companions using the far UV spectroscopy from the IOE satellite. And then uh, later on, I will talk about our most recent work for the confirmation of the STO, uh, uh, STO companion stars using the data from the Hubble Space Telescope. And near the end, I will conclude my talk with my current and future work. So in the beginning, let's talk about the B stars. So as we know, the B stars, they are the B-type main sequence stars and their spectrum display the bomber emission night profiles. And uh, such, uh, such emission features uh, mostly comes from the circumstellar disk, uh, decretion disk around the stars. And as we know, the B stars, another prominent features is because the B stars, they are very fast rotators. And for some B stars, and their, their uh, rotational velocity can even reach more than 75% of their criti um, critical rotational velocity. So showing on the left panel is an artist's conceptions of the B binary five per se. So showing on the right, on the right um, corner here, that's the five per se, that's the B stars. And you can see the whole star is all surrounded by a very massive circumstellar decretion disk. And then showing on the lower left corner, that's the very tiny and hot subgroup companions of the five per se. And uh, so the question is, so why the B stars is so fossil taters and how do they form? So this question has a puzzle community for, for many, many years. So there are many three different ideas suggesting the fossil rotation and also the formation scenarios for the B star. So the first idea is the primordial origin. So for these ideas, so, the, so they pretty much suggest the B stars are pretty much formed as rapid taters once they, are, uh, once they were born. And the second idea is the single star evolutionary uh, channels. So for this idea, they suggest that, so for the B stars as they evolve on the mid-sequence stage, and actually uh, once, they, uh, once they evolve and their convective cores actually start to contract, then there's gonna be a transportation of angular momentum traveling outwards to the envelope. And, and then eventually cause the star to spin up like a very fast rotators. So in actually in, the, uh, in October, and Dr. Alahi Granada gave a very nice talk talking about different angular momentum, trans, um, uh, angular momentum loss rates and also explored different transport efficiencies and how do they affect the results. And alternatively, and there's also a binary formation channels. And this, this one is also a very popular, um, um, popular idea. 
So basically for these channels, they argue that the B stars are most likely formed through a post mass transfer scenario, such that the B stars are formed through stable mass transfer through, uh, uh, through rush loop overflows. So in this idea, so the whole system initially starts with two stars and then with the one component actually is more massive than the other. So when the more massive stars as they involve, as they involve away from the main sequence and they start to inflate in size and then start to feel the rush loop, uh, start to feel the, the rush loop. And once the, the size uh, exit, the, the, the rush size, they start to transfer mass and angular the momentum to the mass gainer stars. So this whole process actually continues until the whole mass transfer, until the formal mass donor stars will lost all the outer envelope and then become a very tiny and the leaked helium core stars that's known as the um, donor star, the, the formal donor stars. So eventually, so the whole uh, scenario depends on the mass of a donor star. If it's mass enough, it might be formed from a neutral stars for black holes, or if it's small enough, it might become a very tiny and a small involved stars. So since that, there are many, uh, can you see the next slide? Okay, so since the, yeah, since the binary deformation channels, so there are many theoretical simulations have done to account for the binary formation channels for the BD binaries. For example, back to 1975, the earlier work by Chris and Harmonic, and they, by using different binary um, mass transfer modes and investigate the B stars, and they suggest so pretty much all the B stars were formed through close binary, binary interactions. And later on, in 1991, Post and Oz, and they conducted another research, and they conclude that, so pretty much up to 60% of the B stars, and they are most likely formed through close binary interactions. And later on, in 1997, however, the uh, close, binary, uh, close binary interaction models suggested by Van Beaver and Van Beaverian, and they suggest that the binary fractions for the B stars only compress about five to 20% of the whole populations. And the most recently, the Shaw and Lee, they actually used the binary population synthesis models to predict the binary fractions of the B stars. And they conclude there's gonna be only like a 13 to 30% of the B stars are most likely to be in binaries. And also the most recent work from Hatchins and they also investigated or studies by investigating the binary B fractions in open clusters. And they conclude that, so no more than 30% of the B stars in open clusters are most likely formed through binary formation channels. And however, from uh, on the observational side, there are many efforts has been done to investigate the binary interactions for the B, uh, for the B systems. So for example, back in 2005, the mix we and the guys, they have conducted a photometric surveys to investigate the uh, 55 open clusters. So in their results, they conclude that, so pretty much 75% of the stars in their sample are most likely to be fossil taters and um, are pretty much spun up through post the past mass transfer scenarios. And then later on in 2010, the old Meyer and the Parr, and they conclude that the B fractions is only about 30%. But, but the results the results is only based on a sample of 37 billion stars in the sample there. And uh, in the July of earlier this year, and Dr. Julia Bowden Stainers, she actually gave a talk in a July to talk about their recent work to search for the May sequence companions for a sample of 287 early time B stars. And they conclude there's no any detections for the May sequence companions for the B star. And later on in August, and the uh, Dr. Robert Clement actually has present his recent research for the three direct, uh, direct interferometric detections for SDO stars in the B binaries. But, uh, but his earlier work in 2019 from a study of sample for 26 B stars by investigating the B stars SCD distributions. And he concluded that pretty much all the B stars, they display of disk truncation features seen in your sample. So all this information is pretty much provided as indirect evidence, suggesting that many B stars are pretty much formed through the close binary interactions. So however, so if we, uh, if we come down to the numbers so far, so pretty much there are about 200 B and X3 binaries found so far, and there is one confirmed B and a black hole binaries found by Cassaris back in 2014. And then there's a very famous, the LB1 system, and also the hr 6 a 19 system. So even though the nature of a companion of these two systems are still very debating. And 
Besides that, now we have the 17 B and a suburb binary resistance detected from FUV spectroscopy so far, and also the four potential candidates. So in this talk today, I'm going to talk about our recent works for detection for the B and SDU binaries. And before that, so before I move into the details about our past works to search for SDU companions from IOE service, so I think maybe it works, to, uh, it works sometimes to go back and look at, to, uh, to look at uh, the historical detections of the B and SDU binary resistance from literature. So by the time when we start our research, so there are actually four known B and SDU binary resistance. So they are known as the HR2142, there's FY Canis majors. And it is interesting to know that the FY Canis majors actually is the first detection of SDU, um, SDU companion star from IUE. And also we have the 59 Cygni and also the 5 per se. And the 5 per se actually was later confirmed by using the HST far UV spectroscopy by guys in 1998. So normally, generally, uh, searching for the sub, uh, subdwarf companions is very challenging and it's very difficult, mainly because of four different reasons. The first reason is because they are very faint. So if you look at their flux ritual contributions, so pretty much for all the four known detections we, ha yeah, we have so far, so the flux contribution of the companions, they only contribute to only a few percent of the flux compared with the B component. So oftentimes, they will be pretty much lost in a glare of a B stars. But just be, um, just, just, just be aware of that, the 5 per se, which is very bright, and they contribute 16%, that's so a very special case. So I will talk about this in later of a talk today. And the second reason is it's very hard to search for these SDO stars, it's because they have a longer period. So for all the known detections we have so far, the orbital period pretty much spans about one month to a couple months. So if, that, so if that's the case, so oftentimes, if we do not have a complete orbital coverage, phase coverage, so we may miss a detection. That's the second challenging part. And then the third part is the small mass, uh, mass ratio. So for all the known detection we have so far, as you can see from the third column of the table, so pretty much all the mass ratio of the SDO stars, they are very tiny, it's about 0 0.1. So in other words, they have a very small mass, and therefore, there's going to be a very small reflex orbital motions of the B stars. So therefore, it's always very hard to, to tackle the features from the spectroscopy. And lastly, is their temperatures. So as you can see from the table, so pretty much all the stars, they have a temperature around 43 kilokelvins, maybe even up to 53 kilokelvin. So which means they are very, very hot. So you, because they are much hotter compared with the B component, so therefore, they will contribute more flux towards the shorter women's region of a spectrum. So therefore, that's the reason why it's best to search for their features in the far UV. Okay, so it is interesting to know that, so actually five per six, it is the first direct interferometric detections uh, uh, discovered by the Chara Array with the Merck instrument. So back to 2015, Murad and his collaborators actually have resolved the astrometric orbit of the five per six systems. And in their work, they report that so for the five percent, the SDU companions, so they actually contribute about 16% of light from the UV part. But however, if we go down to the visible night, the flux only contributes down to like 3%. But if we go down to even further to, uh, to the edge band, they only contribute about 1.5% um, about of the flux. And the most recently, and our colleagues, Dr. Robert Kleiman, actually just report his recent work for the three direct, uh, for the direct interferometric detections for another three SDO stars, that including the 20A Cygni and also the V2119 Cygni and also the 60 Cygni stars. So after we talk about all the historical detections for the B and SDO binaries, now I'm going to talk about our past works to search for the SDO stars using the IOE spectroscopy. So our first stars in our target will be the 60 Cygnis. So actually we select this target from a sample of six known single night B binaries. And because as we mentioned before, they contribute more flux in the shorter wavelengths regions. So that's really why we have collected 23 observations from the International Ultraviolet Explorer satellite. And all the observations actually were recorded uh, from the shorter wavelengths prior cameras. So which has a resolving power about 13 uh, sorrent and the wavelength covers about 1150 to 1950 angstroms. 
And once we have all our data, so we pretty much just reduce our data following the standard IOE ideal data uh, reduction pipelines. And once we have that re uh, reduced data, we are trying to uh, search for the features for SDO stars by using our cross correlation techniques. So the basic idea for the cross correlation is we are trying to compute the CCF functions. So between the observations and the model template. So the idea for that is because as we know, because we only observe the spectrons, it's pretty much like a composite features from the both the B component and also the SDO companions, if there's one. Because the two components, they have a different temperatures, they have different properties, and therefore, and their model spectrums would be different as well. So if there's going to be a companion hiding in a composite spectrums, by doing such CCF technique cross correlations, we are able to detect the signal from the companions. So therefore, we have to construct a model template for the SDO stars and then looking for the signature of the, uh, um, the companion stars. Well, so first we need to construct a model template for the SDO stars. Well, as we mentioned before, so for the four known detections, um, the SDO detection we know in so far, they're all very hot. So therefore we have constructed our model template with a very hot uh, template with 45 kilokelvins with a gravity about 4.75. Well, because this, because uh, the gravity is pretty much the highest values available in a grid, in a elastic grid. But however, we understand in the real situations, the gravity might be underestimated the true value of the SDO stars. And besides that, we are assuming the template has a solid abundance and then there's no any rotational brownings involved. And we are also assuming the microturbine velocity is about 10 clock per second for the stars. So ideally, so once we have a cross correlations and if we have the radial velocity from the both two components, ideally we are able to separate the two different components of a CCF and then, we are able, and then we are able to investigate their features individually. But unfortunately, because of the IOE data, because the signal noise is very low, it's only like a 20 per resolution element. So that's really why we are trying to measure the radial velocity from the B component using IOE data. But unfortunately, because it's too scattered to make any very solid conclusion. So that's really, that's really why eventually we have decided to adopt the orbital elements from the literature to derive the radial velocity um, as a type of, 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 um, of our observations. So once we have our derived radial velocity from both two components of the systems, then we are going to, we are, we are able to apply an iterative scheme of the CCF known as a tomography algorithms to actually separate the CCF features of the two components. So once we separate the two different components features, we are able to see how the feature of a secondary look like for the CCF. So by doing this uh, CCF techniques, so eventually for the whole sample of the six single night B star binaries, as you can see, pretty much there's nothing uh, showing in the picture, but except for one striking case, that is the 60 signal, which is also known as the HD 200310. As you can see there, there's a very striking peak near the center of a detection. So we, yeah, so for the whole six targets, we only have one detections from the samples. So based on the CCF peak strength, and then we are able to determine their flux ratios. So for this particular stars, the SDO companions so pretty much contribute about 3% of the flux compared to its B component. So based on the inclination and also the mass function estimate for the primary B stars from literature and also from the size, we are able to determine and estimate the mass of the, the mass of the um, SDO stars. And it has a mass about 1.7 solar mass and the radius is about 0.48 solar radii. And based on the mass and the radius, and then we're able to derive the gravity. So it's, it's gonna be up, up, uh, about 5.3. And, and in the beginning, so we thought the mass of the subdwarf companions for the city signals is very interesting because it's much higher than the 1.4 solar mass, which is the Chandra Sika mass limit. So it's, it's totally possible. This stars, the, the, this SDU stars will be the progenitor of the potential supernova event. So maybe in the futures, this B, X, uh, this B binaries will become a BX three binaries in the future. But however, the most recent work from our colleague, Dr. Robert Clement, and he has used the chariot arrays to directly detect the companions of these binaries. And in his work, he reported that SDU stars has a mass of about 1.2 solar mass. It's a little bit uh, smaller compared with our estimations. And we think that the discrepancy mainly comes from the different estimations for the primary BE masses. 
So based on our detections for the subdorf companions in a 60 seconds, so we are wondering, so how many B and steel binaries actually will be hiding in the IOE database? But uh, so, uh, so that's the motivations for doing this IOE survey work. But uh, the problem is that because for all the IOE data we have, so we do not know what is the binary properties and their status for the binarity. So based on these reasons, so we have to make a very simple assumption. So we are assuming if the S2 stars, if they are bright enough, so maybe we, we, uh, we will still be lucky enough to detect their features, even with a single observations. So that's the reason why, based on, this um, based on this motivations, we have collected a huge sample of stars that includes like a 627 B stars. And we're also including another 38 reputators as our final samples. And then we've gone through everything and trying to figure out how many spectrums will be available from the IOE to do this analysis. And eventually by doing a cross matching, and we found that there's gonna be only 264 stars or, uh, have available spectrums from the IOE. That corresponds to about 3,203 uh, spectrum available from the database. And once again, and once we have our reduced data, and we are trying to search for their signatures by using cross correlation, by doing a, uh, the CCF calculations between the observed spectrum and also template spectrums. And like we mentioned before, because all the known S2 stars, they are very hot. So that's the reason why we have made our, we have generated our model template with a very hot temperatures with a 45 kilokelvin. And besides that, we have applied another threshold, uh, another detection threshold for the sonata noise between 3.0 as our detection limit. I will talk about this just in a moment. So the question is, why are we are choosing this particular threshold? So that's because based on the known detections. So showing on the figures over here, if you look at the first top of panels of the plot, that's the CCF plot for the detections for the SDUs we know in so far. So showing on the left panel in the purple um, in, the, in the purple box, that is the um, very hot SDU companions found for the five perceived binaries. And on the right panel in the box, that is the very faint SDU companions found for the FY candidate majors. So as you can see, so for all this, uh, for based on these detections, we calculate the peak strength of the CCF for the peak detections compared with the background noise and try to see what's the signal noise distribution for all the detections. So it looks like the 3.0, it looks like the lower limit for our detection limit. So that's the reason why we have to, we have to choose this uh, detection threshold to select our data. And later on, so we also applied for an, uh, uh, another two different selection criteria to search for SDU stars based on their morphologies of a CCF. So the first criteria is we are looking for the CCFs with very narrow features to be distinguished from a very broad feature. So the evidence for this criteria is that because as we know, most B stars, they are facilitators. So therefore they have a very large VCI value and therefore the CCF web is gonna be very, very broad. But however, for the known detections of the SDU stars we have so far, they're all, uh, they all very small and very narrow component. So that's the reason why we are going to select only the narrow component to be distinguished from the, um, the broad component. So uh, showing on, uh, um, on the lower left panels, that's one example of the very facilitators, the gamma cast stars. As you can see, this B star is a very facilitator. It has a very large base I values. So therefore, the CCF is very broad as we expected because of the reputation. But however, if you look at the detections for uh, SDU stars on the first row of the plot, the first two panels, the detection of SDU stars, the signal actually is very narrow. So that's the reason why we have to initiate this first criterion. The SDU companions, we have a very narrow component compared with the very broad B component. And, but however, we do have some we do encounter some bias. For example, showing on a figure here, if you look at uh, the first plot on the second row of the plot here, as in the orange box, that's the cases when the B stars actually is a very hot stars. So, because as we, uh, uh, um, as I mentioned before, because we use the 45 kilokelvin templates as the model templates to do the cross correlation. So if the B stars is a very hot stars, and therefore, the BE stars will actually have a strong correlation with a template. So therefore, the CCF will be also be, um, be, it's going to be very narrow. 
So in that case, that would be very difficult to, to distinguish with the features from the SDO feature. And other than that, sometimes, and the B star are not always like bus rotators. Sometimes we do have slow rotator cases, just like the case showing on the lower right um, panel in the orange box showing over there. So as you can see, for these stars, it's a slow rotators with a small visa I values. So in that case, the CCF will also looks like a very narrow as well. So if we encounter these orange boxes cases, that would be very hard to, to, to distinguish the features from the SDO count detection and also this different um, bias. But besides that, so that's the reason why we think this the first criterion is not enough to identify all the SDO companions from the CCF uh, from the CCF analysis. So that's the reason why we have to add another criterion, which is the orbital motions of SDO stars. Uh, in the beginning of the talk, if you do remember, I put a small tables tabulate all the known detections and the features for the SDO stars. And all the known SDO stars we have so far, they're all like a very small mass and a very small mass ratios. So in other words, if they have a very small mass ratio and a small mass, and then their orbital motions will be very huge because compared with the semi amplitude of the B stars, their Doppler shift will be significantly different from the B component. So that's, so that's the reason why we're looking for the cases where the CCF will show a significant amount of Doppler shifts. So showing on the first row over here, that's the two cases with the two detections for the SDO stars, the five per C and also the FY Kennedy's major. As you can see, besides the very narrow peak, we also see a significant amount of Doppler shift showing on the CCF. That's because due to the SDO's Doppler shift in the binary system. So that's the second criteria. But unfortunately, uh, sometimes we do not have enough observations. And often the cases, we only have one or two observations. That might be not enough to make this Doppler shift uh, to classify it's going to be your companions or not. And often the cases, sometimes if the B stars, they have a much longer orbital period, for example, more than a couple of months, even up to like a year's uh, um, orbital period, in that case, it's, it's totally possible that uh, they will have a very small RV variations. So therefore, it's going to be very difficult to trace their uh, variation, the variations at, um, as well. Okay, so even though uh, based on these two different criteria, so we have we used two criteria to select any SDO companions from our uh, samples for every single star so one by one by eyes. And eventually, we, so we have 12 candidate binaries. So showing, on, uh, showing here, that's the first eight detections from the samples. As you can see, for all the detections showing here, they all display very sharp CCF detection peak. And also for most of them, they display a significant amount of um, Doppler shift as well. And then besides the eight detections, we also have another four candidate binaries. And for these four candidates, as you can see, we only have one observation for three of them. So we, we do not have more information about the Doppler shift, but uh, there, uh, the, the narrow peak, the signal is still strong enough. So that's the reason why we have classified as a candidates. And for the last one showing on the right uh, lower panel over there, is, we do have two observations, but as you can see, for one of the observations, the signal is very weak. It barely satisfied the detection threshold. So that's the one we still classified as a candidate. So overall, we have 12 candidates from a total collections of 264 stars. So we are also interested in what's the spectrum type distributions for the B detectors we have so far. So for all the samples of the 264 stars, as you can see, so for all the distributions, the solid, the black solid histograms represent the full sample of the 264 stars in the sample. And then the dotted lines just indicates the non-detections of the B stars in our sample. And then the histograms with the field histograms showing in the bottom here, that's the detections for the B stars hosting suburb companions. So pretty much you can look, so for all our stars in our samples, they all have a peak distributions near the early type of B stars. So there's no doubt. So why, so our detections for the SDU stars, they also tend to have a early type of B, uh, B stars, B star component as well. But uh, there's a uh, um, puzzle is that for the late type of B, uh, B type stars, especially after B4, there's no any single detection from SDU com companion stars. So that is like very strange. And we are trying to figure out, so why there is such amazing late type of B stars? 
So, but according to um, from the uh, theoretical point of views, so if the B stars they have gone through the close binary interactions, and then after the, the um, after the binary interactions, eventually the formal mass Skinner star and now is observed as the B stars. Theoretically, they should have a very wide range of the spectrum types from early type down to the late type. But however, the appearance of the spectrum types for the B stars is strongly depends on the initial mass ratio and distribution, and therefore, and also depends on the mass transfer scenarios. So for example, Post et al, back to 1991, they suggest that if the B stars, the initial binary resistance, if they have a very flat initial mass ratio distributions, so therefore, it's highly possible the final B stars after going through the binary interactions will tend to be like early type of B type stars. For example, only have a type between B0 and B5, just like the case we're showing over here. But however, it is also possible for some of the B stars, especially for like late type B stars, it's, uh, it is also possible they have gone through like a very extremely mass transfer scenario. So by doing that, so by going so by going through that mass transfer scenarios, the formal mass donors uh, the formal mass donor stars have quickly evolved into a helium core burning white dwarf stars. So therefore, for that kind of binary resistance, it is likely maybe they will have a very low mass companion stars. Just like the case uh, we found from the ELCBNs were like the regular binary resistance in which they have a mass sequence companion star, but also it's a very small and low mass companion stars. That's highly possible. And just like the recent, the very famous case in the LB1 and also the HR6A1i, even though the nature of a companion is still not very certain, but it's possible that so many of the B stars in our samples, they do actually have a cooler companions. So, um, so for our future works, we definitely need to walk down these avenues to explore the possibility of a cooler companions for the B stars. But overall, but just be aware of that, there is a very crucial reality for our uh, survey results. Because in the beginning, like, uh, like, uh, like, uh, like I mentioned, so for our searches, we are mainly focused on searching for uh, bright uh, steel companion stars for our samples. So therefore, it is highly possible there's gonna be a huge amount of stars because the SDO stars are much, much fainter. So they are much fainter, so therefore we cannot detect because of the detection limit. Just like in the case for the HR2142. So in the beginning of a talk, I tabulated the, their features in a small table. So if you still do remember for HR2142s, the SDO companions is very faint. It only contributes about 1% of the flux compared to the BE component. So therefore, uh, for this uh, histogram um, showing over here, the HR2142 uh, is not included here because it's way too thin and it's way too, yeah, it's way too small and compared with our de uh, detection threshold. So that may be the reason why, because there are so many companions that are just much, much thinner. So that's the reason why we are not able to detect their features in our current survey. So, so far, so here's a very short brief summaries for the SDU the IOE survey work we have done. So by doing the, the IOE survey work, so we detect uh, pretty much 12 new B and SDO binary resistance from IOE survey work. So that is pretty much triple the current knowing size of the B and SDO binaries. And by, by looking at their spectrum type distributions, so pretty much most SDO stars and their spectrum types will tend to have early type stars, um, mostly between B0 and B3. And for the 12 detections we have so far, compared with the whole sample size, that only corresponds to a 6% of our detection rates. And overall, and so, and overall, and uh, so pretty much what we detect so far is, is only represent a very small portions of the real populations. So there's still a, pretty much a big majority of, of the populations still uh, remain undetected. So one possible uh, uh, explanations for that is for, uh, it's because they are much, much fainter. Uh, sorry, they are much, much fainter. So one case is actually is for the five percent. Uh, like I mentioned in the beginnings, for the five percent, the SDO companions, the flux contributions, they contribute like a sixty percent of the flux compared with the B component. It's like a very bright compared with other cases. Well, because the, for the five five, uh, five percent, it's like a very special case. So back in two thousand eighteen, uh, theorist Schultermeyer's they actually conducted a theoretical work to investigate 
the evolutionary scenarios of the B, uh, B system fibrosis. So they conclude that, so pretty much for the SDO companions in the binaries, they are pretty much like a very rare and a very short lived um, temporary uh, stage as known as the uh, shell, uh, the, the helium shell burning stage. So it's a very short and a very bright stage. So maybe that's the case because it's bright enough to be detected by the detection so far. So that's the reason why maybe the majority of the detections we have so far is that they are just too faint. So that's the reason why we are not able to detect their features. So, so far I talk about our detections for the SDO stars by using the past works for our IOE works. But however, for these 12 candidate detections, we are not sure if there's gonna be a true detections where there's gonna be some spurious detection. So that's the reason why later on we have to initiate um, our uh, confirmation work. So, so try, to conf uh, try to verify the detection of SDO stars by using the spectrum, the FUV spectroscopy from the Hubble Space Telescope. So here I'm gonna talk about our most recent work by doing the confirmation work. So like I mentioned um, before, so from our IOE survey work, so we have a 12 detections for the B and SDO binaries. And uh, in 2018, one of our collaborators and Dr. Joe Chernovsky, he actually, um, by using a large set of observations from APO data, and he actually can um, made a first detection, um, sorry, not a first detection, um, made a detection for the SDO companions for the uh, HD55606 binary systems. So by including all the stars together, we conclude a sample of 13 B stars totally. So we all observe all these stars by using the MAMA detectors and within the E140M shell gradients. And for this gradients, so the wavelength coverage for the spectrum graph covers between 1144 and also uh, up to 1710 angstroms. And for this shell gradients, it has a resolving power of about 45,800. So showing on the right panel over here, that's one example of the off-surface spectrum for one of our target, which is HD43544. So showing on the panel here, you can see the observed uh, observations from the, uh, from the off-surface uh, spectrum is showing as a black color in the bottom there. And then the model spectrum for the B component is showing as a blue color in the middle. And then the model spectrum for S2 companions is showing as a green color on the top. So the first task, we need to confirm that the detections for all our 13 targets. And once again, and then we use the CCF technique. And uh, based on the detection we have so far, we still make the very hot templates uh, using the 45 kilokelvin templates. And then once again, doing a cross correlation and then search for the fi uh, figures. And uh, so showing on the lower left panels, that's the residual CCFs for the STL um, detections for one of the stars in our samples. So I will talk about how do we get the residual CCF just in a moment, okay? But before that, we first need to measure the radio velocity of the B stars before doing the, uh, um, um, be, um, before investigating the, the, uh, their CCF features. Uh, there, um, so we first calculate the radio velocities by forming a model template and doing the cross correlations with our observations. So as you can see, because the B stars, they are fossil taters, so therefore the CCFs are very broad. So simply feeding on Gaussian to the CCF won't give us a very reliable results. So that's the reason why we have initiated using a bisector technique. So we um, pretty much just use two opposite signed Gaussians to feed for the CCF tails to estimate the radio velocity. So by, um, by determining the B radio velocities first, so later on we are going to uh, uh, later on, we are trying to determine the CCF features of the subgraph com component only. And uh, as we mentioned before, because for the uh, observer spectrum, it's pretty much like a composite feature of a both the B star and also the SDU companion star. So the CCF features will also include two components together as well. So showing on the left panel, that's one example of the CCF observations with the model template. Showing on the, in the black colors, you can see there's a very narrow component and also a very broad component near the bottom here. So that suggests there's two different components. The narrow component comes from the very hot, small and faint subgraph companion. And also the very broad bottom near the bottom part, that's a contribution from the B stars. So in order to investigate the CCF feature for the subgraph ownings, 
So we need to subtract the contribution from the B stars in order to investigate the properties. So that's the reason why we had to measure the radio velocity first, because first we need to uh, construct a model CCF to match with the bottom part, the very bottom portions, and then shift their velocity to reference phase. And therefore we can do the subtractions. And then eventually we're aiming to get the residual features from the companion only, then to study their parameters. So how do we do that? So pretty much we're just generating a model CCF by cross-correlating the B model spectrons with the SDU model spectrons. And then we are going to arbitrarily scale the tails of the CCF to match with the observations. And after doing that, we're going to subtract the contributions. So that's the reason why eventually by doing all these subtractions, what we left over is will be only the contribution from the subgroup companion only that is showing it in a green color as the very uh, tiny CCF showing on a, uh, in, in the left panel over there. So by doing this CCF works, so eventually for all the 13 detections, we found the 10 detections showing on the right panel is another example of a detections for the companions in our sample. And uh, besides the 10 detections, we have another three non-detections and we didn't see any features for the three non-detection. So based on the features, once we have the residual feature for the CCF companions, so the physical appearance of the residual CCF, for example, such as their weight and their height, pretty much reflect the physical properties of the subgroup companions. For example, their temperatures, their rotations, and their flux ratios, all these informations are pretty much all encoded in the spectrum of the observed composite spectrum observations. And therefore, this information will also be encoded in the CCF features as well. So that's really why our next goal is trying to detangle and try to decode all these physical parameters from the CCF feature. So for example, first we have them is we're trying to generate model grids for the uh, CCFs with different uh, uh, rotational velocities. So once we get a relationship between a CCF, the, their width, and, then, and also with respect to the rotational velocity, we're able to use our observed values to interpolate and therefore to estimate the upper limit of the rotational velocity for the STU stars. And similarly, and we're also going to generate model grids for different uh, template for the stars, the STU stars with different temperatures. And then by investigating the, the CCF peak height features as a function of the temperatures, we're able to estimate the temperature of a steel star as well. And besides that, and furthermore, and based on the flux ratios of the binary resistance, we are also able to investigate what's going to be the relationship between the CCF peak height by assuming different flux ratios, and therefore use our observed values to determine what's going to be the flux ratio of the binary system. So eventually, once we have all the information last today, because we, we observe the flux of the stars from observations, and therefore compare the observed stars with the, uh, with the models through SED fittings, we're able to determine the angular size of the B star in the sky. And also by using the distance of, of, um, obtained from the Gaia's, we're able to determine the size of the B stars, and therefore eventually determine the size of the SD stars as well. So by doing all the CCF analysis, so eventually uh, we obtain their sizes, we obtain their temperatures. So our final goal is we are trying to compare all our determined parameters with the theoretical models and then to determine their evolutionary status. So showing over here is it's a two different evolutionary plots for our results. Showing on the left is, uh, radio, uh, is the uh, radius over the temperature plot and then showing on the right panels is the luminosity over temperature plot. So we have we pretty much just, just adopt the evolutionary tracks for the script stars from the Goldenberg's work in 2018. So pretty much in their work, uh, the assuming the stars has gone through the KSP mass transfer, so which means the mass transfer scenarios uh, will be starts when the formal mass donor stars actually will enter, we're evolving towards a really giant phases. So in that cases, the stars actually evolve away from the mass synchronous and then start to inflate in size, transfer masses to the inner star, and eventually strip off the outer atmosphere, become a very small and faint Hinean stars. So by using the models, we pretty much just plot four different tracks with the four different initial masses for the estimation. And all determine the masses, uh, the temperatures, and also the radius for the subgroup stars 
So you can pretty much see most of the stars, they are pretty much staying at a you know, cool burning stage, but there's still a few cases that either at a, or the early contraction phase moving towards the helium core burning stage, where we're most likely just post the helium core burning stage, moving towards a more brighter shell burning stage. And besides our detections from the uh, IOE survey work, we also plot the known detections and their properties on the plot as well. So as you can see, pretty much all the determined luminosity and the radius and temperatures matches with the models pretty much very well, except for one case for HR2142. Because for HR2142, because for these stars and the, the companions is very faint. And also as report from earlier studies, it is highly possible the companions of HR2142 are most likely to be obscured by the certain standard um, material, uh, materials. So that's the reason why we are assuming, we, are, we suspect the, uh, the radius of HR2142 is pretty much only like a lower limit. So that's the why it's far from the tracks it's showing over here. So, so far as we talk about uh, our most recent work for the confirmations for SDO companions. So near the end, I will conclude my talk with the current and the future works. So as we mentioned before, so based on the detections, we use the FUV spectroscopies, we have determined the sizes and also the radius, uh, the size and also the temperatures of SDO companion stars. But however, the other two very important appears to understanding the evolutionary scenarios of the BE binaries, including the orbital periods and also the mass, they are still missing. So that's the reason why we have started on two different observing campaigns starting in 2019, try to do a follow-up, optical follow-ups for this all 13 binary systems. So that including the five southern hemisphere stars we're observing with the smart current observations and also eight uh, stars in the northern hemispheres. That's the observations from our case spectrum graph from APOs. So in our most recent work, the, um, our colleague, Dr. Robert Clement, actually recent report the detections for three uh, SDU companions in the Chara arrays. So pretty much besides that, we still have five um, targets left over for the Northern Hemisphere. So our goals for the, maybe for this year and for next year, uh, for this year and also for next year. So our goals will be trying to finish marrying the radio velocity for all our 10 targets. So by marrying their physical radio velocities, we're going to determine the optical solutions and eventually trying to determine the physical parameters and the most important thing is the masses. So once we have all the information, like the mass, um, radius, and also temperatures, hopefully eventually we're going to compare with different models and eventually trying to form a, trying to trace their formation histories. So that's pretty much everything I have for today. And I thank you very much for listening and I'd be more than happy to take any questions if you have. All right, thank you, Lucian. That was a fantastic talk. I think I can speak for everyone when I say that. Um, but yes, let's open up for questions. We have at least 10 minutes for questions here. If anyone has one, uh, feel free to use the raise hand function in Zoom or uh, type, it in, uh, type it in the chat if you don't, if that's easier. Um, I think I can start off with a pretty simple one though. I might've missed this when you were um, talking about your IUE detections. Um, with all your cross correlation correlation functions, you had a dotted line going across at about 0 0.02, something like that, which I, I think was your detection limit for determining if it was um, a uh, an SDO companion. Yeah. So yeah. So I just I I might have missed how um, how how that dotted line was determined for each. Yeah, okay, so because before this work, there are only four known detections for the SDO companions. Mm -hmm. So pretty much for the known detections, we just pretty much determine what is the peak strength of the CCF compared with the background noise of that detection over there. And then we're going to just form uh, detect, uh, the signal noise as, a, as the ratio between the CCF peak strength and the background noise. So after doing that, so it so, uh, looks like for the four known detections, they are pretty much around the three or four or five. So that's the reason why we have used a 3.0 as the detection threshold to determine as the limit. Ah, okay. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, Julia, please go right ahead. 
Hey, first of all, thanks a lot for the very nice talk. Um, I have a question on, I think it was slide 15 or something along those lines. You mentioned that in your sample for IUE, you had a certain number of BE stars. Ah, yeah, there yes. it is. And then also rapidly rotating stars um, that don't show emission. And I was curious for whether they actually ended up to have spectra and you analyzed them. And if you found uh, what, what kind of companions or did you find any companions to them? And how does it compare to the BE stars? Uh, are you talking about the final results for our detections? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so for our final detections in the 12 candidates, and I think they're all BE stars. So they're pretty much all BE features. So the, 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 the initial motivations we're trying to include in the 38 reputators. So even though they don't, they, they do not show the emission, um, they do not show the emission high profiles, but, they are, but, but, but uh, they are still the facilitators. But uh, for our final 12 candidates, so we don't, uh, I think they are all B stars, I think. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Doug, please go ahead. Hi, Lucien. Hello, everyone. Hi. I just had uh, two uh, very quick comments. Thank you, Lucien, for presenting all this work so nicely. Um, the first comment was that uh, uh, one of the first detections of these SDO spectra was actually made by a University of Western Ontario astronomer named uh, Roland Pokert, who back in uh, 1981, uh, using optical spectroscopy, noticed that uh, there was an emission line in the spectrum of Phi Persei, uh, which uh, uh, showed motions that were counter to the motions of the BE star itself. And uh, Roland realized that this was uh, an indication that, it, uh, it, that this emission line was coming from the companion and that it must have been a very hot companion because it was this ionized uh, helium, helium-2-4686 line. Uh, and, and that's, I think, today still a, a remarkable observation that is worth uh, being reminded of, as well as uh, 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 sort of starting off this whole area in such an important way. Uh, I think what it means to me is that if there's an emission line coming from the vicinity of the SDO and Phi Per, that there must be some reverse mass transfer going on right now, that maybe some of the material from the BE star disk is leaking across the gap between the stars and is actually forming an accretion disk around the subdwarf uh, to create this uh, uh, helium-24686 emission line. So anyway, I thought that was interesting. The, the other uh, comment I wanted to make um, is that uh, I think we're beginning to realize that uh, binary evolution, although it can lead to uh, formation of a subdwarf, uh, in some circumstances, binary evolution can lead to a merger. Uh, and this is particularly systems that might have had uh, short periods to begin with or, or, or systems that might have had a more extreme mass ratio before they began their interaction. And that uh, in many circumstances, it may be that a merger can end up as a very, very rapidly rotating star. So I, I just think we should be open minded about this right now since we're still so early in this game. But it may be that uh, some of the BE star population might represent uh, actual mergers. So stars that had gone through a, a binary process, but now we won't ever see a companion because it got swallowed by the BE star. So anyway, I just threw out those two ideas just to uh, enlarge our conversation. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Doug. Those are very uh, interesting points. Um, anybody else, any questions for Lucian? Still have a few minutes here, if you like. Uh, Dietrich, please. Yeah, uh, Lucian, uh, congratulations on your work. And uh, thank you for a very clear presentation. And I'm very glad uh, that at least in this way, I finally <coughs> uh, meet you, so to speak. Um, I would like to follow up on what Julia said uh, concerning uh, the non-BE stars, uh, because I think they may hold the key to the whole story and uh, that the BE stars have emission lines may be just confusing. And um, in my opinion, the difference between BE stars and BN stars is uh, that the BE stars have pulsations that help them to eject matter. We don't know how the details work. And um, in the context of your work, the real interesting thing is uh, what spins up uh, the, these very rapid stars. And it would really be interesting uh, to find more stars like Regulus. You mentioned this only very briefly, uh, but I think that's a point in case 
um, to um, study the general theme. Uh, whereas I think the nature of the BE stars may be confusing uh, the issue. You mean the, the emission features for B stars? Yeah, mm -hmm. because these BE stars are so active and they're doing so weird things in some cases um, that this uh, may distract the attention. So if one, if one could widen the scope of this work to rapidly rotating B stars, irrespective of whether they have emission lines or not, uh, then one could get a clearer picture, one could ask a clearer question and might get also a very clear answer. Yeah, that's a very good point. And uh, yeah, I briefly mentioned about it in the talk. So actually, so for our IOE detections, so pretty much all the detections we have so far, that's tend to have the like B stars tend to like a, to be early type of B stars. But however, we are missing the late type of B stars. For example, um, late type of, um, later than B4 or even a B7 type, we didn't see any detections. Well, first of all, maybe it could be an observational bias. But second one, like I mentioned before, it's totally possible there's got to be like a even no even much much lower mass companion stars hiding over there. That could be not, not, that could be another possibilities uh, as well. I think. Yeah, um, I mean, if one does not find uh, SDO or similar stars around rapidly <coughs> rotating B stars without emission lines, uh, that would of course also be a very very exciting result because then one has to ask oneself why are the BE stars different. Uh, and um, then there is an additional yeah. difference that is independent of the pulsations, and maybe the pulsations then have something to do with the evolutionary history. Yeah. Um, concerning Duck's uh, suggestion that uh, uh, many BE stars may alter the product of mergers, uh, I think that's a very good point. Um, there is one star uh, that rotates rapidly and seems to be a merger, at least that's the, the currently prevalent opinion in the literature, is Tau's Co. And uh, Tau's Co seems to differ from many other B-type stars in that it has a very tangled magnetic field. And uh, BE stars do not have large-scale magnetic fields. Um, but it would make sense to search for magnetic fields that are similar to those of uh, Tau's Co. And these magnetic fields do not last very long. Uh, so the fraction of such stars might be small, but it could still be rewarding uh, to search for highly tangled, highly structured magnetic, magnetic fields uh, in BE stars as one way of possibly identifying uh, merger products. Okay, nice. Thank you. Okay, um, we're about out of time here. Is there any last questions for Lucian? We can maybe take one more. Yes, Ignacio, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, yeah, thank you very much for this talk. I think this work you're doing is really key to understand how binary evolution works in, in massive stars and just not sure if I missed this or, or you just didn't say. You mentioned um, when you talked about the IEE uh, survey, you mentioned a uh, detection rate of 6% for the whole survey, as I understand. But uh, I think that's a very meaningful number. And I was thinking the, the meaningful number would be the, the, the fraction of detections for early type stars for which you had uh, several observations. Have you got a, a number for that? Sorry, I missed your questions. What's your questions? Can you say one more time? Yeah. I think that the meaningful number here would be the number of early B stars that you detect compared to the number of early B stars with several observations. Because okay. the rest are just affected by different biases. Yes. So how, how much would it, would it be, that number? Um, not for sure, no. Sorry about that. Yeah, not mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I assume you haven't got that number, but I think that's, that, that's the important number. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if...
Um, there are no I'll other. Just, I'll just add, thank you very oh. much, Lucien. You're the last talk before the holiday break. And I really appreciate that you stayed up so very late at night in order to give this talk. It was um, extremely clear and well-organized and very interesting. And I think it, it spawned a lot of um, really nice discussion as well. So thank you very much uh, for making the time for us. Thank you. Yes, certainly. Thank you, Lucien. Um, so yeah, I think that will bring this talk to a close then. Thank everyone for coming. Um, and as always, if you'd like a recording, uh, feel free to email myself or Carol and we can get uh, the recordings of this talk or past talks to you as well. Um, and we'll hopefully see you all in January for the next one. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.